these often involve the most commonly known of the transgender community, men and women who identify as the opposite gender. But there's another branch of transgenders, those who feel they are not fully male or female, but somewhere in between. CCTV's Karina Huber reports on a growing trend on America's college campuses to recognize a third neutral gender. It's the beginning of the school year at the University of Vermont, and the Alley Center is hosting a picnic. At this gathering, there are people who identify as women and others who identify as men, whether they be straight, gay, bisexual, or transgender. But there are also those who identify as something in between. I don't feel like I identify fully as a woman, and I don't really feel like I identify as a man. I kind of... Um, there's a lot, I found a lot of freedom in letting go of that. Sierra doesn't want to be called she or he, but something more neutral like they or them. They, them was, uh, came up in the, the early days as kind of the easiest alternative pronoun. Good. I think we're in really, really good shape. Dot Brower, who runs the Alley Center, also recently adopted the they, them pronoun. I've always, in my, inside of myself, since I was a kid, thought of myself as not especially masculine or especially feminine. And, and it was, I was really slow to realize that I wanted to ask for that too. Growing numbers of students are asking for gender neutral pronouns and the University of Vermont has taken notice. In 2009, UVM became the first university in the United States that allowed students to select a gender neutral pronoun. That selection is then put into the school's database so that professors get things right when addressing them. The changes to the database has cost the university $80,000 and six months to design. There are also gender-neutral bathrooms and housing on campus. The move has largely been embraced by the students on campus, but there were some question marks. You know, I think it's confusing for anyone. It was confusing for me when people first started talking about it. A lot of people have the intent of being supportive. They just don't understand where the pronouns are coming from. Um, and so I think a lot of times it's just um, teaching other people who aren't as aware of using they them pronouns why it's important. Students say being identified the way they perceive themselves is vitally important. Being able to come into a space where you can really just openly like be honest with yourself about who you are I think it's really important for students because college is the time for personal growth. Students across the United States seem to agree. Hundreds of other U.S. colleges have reached out to UVM for guidance on setting up similar pronoun neutral programs. Change is afoot on Facebook's California campus. The social media giant has made a modification that may go unnoticed for most of the 159 million American users. Facebook wants to allow people to be able to express their genuine, authentic selves on the site, and we want them to express their whole selves. For the first time ever, users aren't limited to identifying themselves as male or female. For the first time, I get to go to the site and I get to specify to all the people that I know what my gender is, and I can let only the people that I want to know see that. Software engineer Brielle Harrison worked on the project. She's also undergoing gender transformation from male to female. It's the best way for us to be able to express ourselves and to let people know who we really are. There are actually about 50 options including androgynous, intersex, and gender fluid. The transgender community has been um, having a lot of progress in regards to inclusiveness and to being um, accepted in society at large. And this is a very good way to do it. It's a step forward that came after years of lobbying from Facebook members. It also follows changes made by other sites, including Flickr and Google+. Just having it as an option um, says a lot to their openness and inclusiveness with the people who use their, um, their website. But even that openness has a limit. All users can manage whether others can see their gender identity on Facebook. You know, basically what I said is that when tyranny occurs traditionally around the world, they try to disarm the people first. And that's exactly, you know, what happened in Germany. You know, in the, you know, mid to late 30s, you know, they started a program of disarming the people. And by the mid 40s, Look at what had happened. Uh, and it's happened in a number of other countries as well. Daniel Webster said tyranny would never occur in America because the people are armed. So there's a reason that we have the Second Amendment. And it doesn't mean that I'm not happy to look at ways to keep these tragedies from occurring 
as long as they don't interfere with the Second Amendment. I would feel much safer if my kid or grandchild was in a school where I knew that there were people who could protect them if somebody like that came in. To me, what I'm talking about is common sense. To uh, some of the people out there, there is no such thing as common sense. President Obama is on a West Coast swing this weekend. Last night, Mr. Obama was at a political fundraiser in Seattle. He addressed the issue of the number of recent mass shootings in the U.S. We know that we've got to do something to prevent the kind of gun massacres that we saw just last week and two months before that and two months before that and two months before that because it is not normal it is not inevitable it doesn't just happen it is a choice that we make and it is a choice that we can change the president's visit to seattle came after his controversial visit to oregon here's john blackstone with more on that the protesters gathered at the Roseburg Airport carried both signs and guns, a potential nightmare for the Secret Service. Alan Montgomery made no attempt to hide his holsters. Is, is part of your statement here the fact that, as I see it, you've got a couple of guns on you? Well, that's not necessarily a statement more than it is just my right. As the president's helicopter arrived, many showed their distaste for his call for more gun control. The White House has indicated the president is considering an executive order that would require more gun retailers to conduct background checks. In spite of the killings here, that remains an unpopular position in this part of Oregon. Sally Telford is a gun owner. Our Second, our Second Amendment says no infringement. That means no infringement. So anybody can have a gun, somebody yes. with mental problems? Yes, can everybody have can have a gun to defend themselves. So you can't just make us get a background check because somebody might have a mental problem. The president's motorcade avoided the largest group of demonstrators on his way to Roseburg High School, where he met privately with families of all the victims of last week's shooting. We're going to have to come together as a country uh, to see how we can prevent these issues from taking place. A showdown in San Francisco between lawmakers concerned with public safety in the city's last remaining gun store reaches an end game. The store is closing under siege from new regulations from City Hall. John Blackstone shows us how gun supporters wonder if it was even a fair fight. The modest storefront in San Francisco's Mission District doesn't do justice to the iconic status of High Bridge Arms. As the last gun shop in San Francisco, it does as brisk a business in souvenir shirts as it does in firearms. We have got a call from someone in uh, from Minnesota yesterday. We sent two off to uh, St. Cloud. <laughs> the shirts have been selling quickly since Highbridge announced it's shutting down. At the end of October, we'll be, uh, we'll be done. General Manager Stephen Al Cairo says the store is being pushed out of business by a proposed city law that would require every gun sale to be videotaped. When a customer takes delivery of their firearm, um, they want us to videotape that person doing that and to submit it to the police department. Gun buyers already have to fill out a detailed form, go through a background check and a waiting period. But sending a videotape of the purchase to local police strikes Al Cairo as one regulation too many. But the idea was just announced uh, that following two weeks, sales just dipped. It was like a ghost town here. Nobody was coming in. In Afghanistan this morning, American military investigators are still not sure why a hospital in the city of Kunduz was bombed. Doctors Without Borders blames the U.S.-led military for Saturday's airstrike. Twenty-two people were killed. The United Nations Human Rights Chief called the attacks inexcusable and possibly even criminal. Mark Phillips is tracking this story from London. Mark, good morning. Good morning. Well, the damage done to the hospital was catastrophic, and the damage done to the reputation of the U.S. air campaign in support of the government in Kabul is, in PR terms, catastrophic as well. The question is no longer whether the MSF hospital in Kunduz was hit by airstrikes, and almost certainly U.S. airstrikes. The question is how and why. Doctors Without Borders, which has run the hospital, says both the government in Kabul and the United States knew where it was and that the air raid continued even after they raised the alarm that the facility was being hit. 
The Afghan government line that Taliban fighters were inside and shooting from the hospital, MSF's UK executive director Vicky Hawkins says, is a lie. The comments coming from the Afghan government are absolutely outrageous. I mean, they are to an extent justifying the destruction of a fully functioning hospital. U.S. Secretary of Defense Ash Carter has promised an investigation. That we be full and transparent about our investigation and also that we hold accountable. Uh, if there is some, someone to be accountable, anybody responsible for doing something they shouldn't have done. But that's not good enough for MSF. We would like an independent investigation and only then will, be, will we be in a position to, to make decisions about the future. But representatives from the international aid group say they refuse to buy into the defense. Claiming that they were targeting fighters is not proven by the facts. So uh, this claim is, is, uh, is ridiculous. Our staff has heard no fighting coming from the compound. The group, also known by its French acronym MSF, has accused the U.S. of violating international safeguards meant to protect hospitals. If these conventions are no longer recognized by the big warring parties, we have a major issue on our mere existence and the action that we do. And not only MSF, but all humanitarian actions. That's why this inquiry is fundamental to have an independent look at what happened, because the fundamental of humanitarian action have been attacked. President Obama delivered a rare personal apology to the head of Doctors Without Borders for a U.S. airstrike on a hospital operated by the medical charity in Afghanistan. That attack killed 22 civilians. Margaret Brennan is at the White House with what the president said. Margaret, good morning. Good morning. Well, after four days of differing stories about how that hospital came under attack, President Obama decided to call Doctors Without Borders and say he was sorry. White House spokesman Josh Earnest said the president made a personal decision to apologize. When a mistake occurs, uh, the United States owns up to it, uh, and we vow to get to the bottom of what exactly happened. According to Doctors Without Borders, its hospital in northern Afghanistan came under repeated direct attack on Saturday from a U.S. AC-130 gunship, even though the U.S. military had the hospital's GPS coordinates. Twelve staff and ten patients, including three children, were killed. A hospital was mistakenly struck. We would never intentionally target a protected medical facility. The head of U.S. forces in Afghanistan, General John Campbell, told Congress this week that Afghan troops had requested the air cover because they were facing a Taliban attack. A slightly different account than a day earlier when the U.S. said American troops had been under threat. It is still unclear whether the American pilots knew that they were firing on a hospital. Those details are the focus of three investigations. Despite the rare presidential apology, Doctors Without Borders says it cannot rely on the U.S. to investigate a possible war crime and is demanding an independent probe. U.S. Director Jason Cohn. We've seen how over the last 96 hours the stories continue to change. Uh, I think, as anyone can imagine, that it's difficult to see how three different uh, parties to a conflict can conduct an investigation uh, impartially and independently. We turn overseas tonight, that massive escalation by Russia, lobbing missiles at Syria, they say targeting ISIS. But tonight, U.S. officials now say some of those missiles accidentally crash-landed in Iran. And troubling images coming in, appearing to show children in Syria being rushed from the scene after those strikes. Here's ABC's chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz, tonight. It was an impressive display of firepower. That volley of 26 cruise missiles headed to Syria. But we now know four of them never made it, crashing into rural Iran. But those Russian airstrikes they claim are targeting ISIS have been devastating. A Syrian aid group says these young children have nothing to do with ISIS. The U.S. says Russia is targeting rebel forces opposing the dictator Bashar al-Assad. Today, U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter predicted Russia will face the consequences for its growing involvement in Syria. We've seen increasingly unprofessional behavior from Russian forces, and I also expect that in coming days the Russians will begin to suffer casualties in Syria. 
David, Russia's involvement poses a danger to the U.S. as well. Those cruise missiles and airstrikes are launched without warning, meaning U.S. pilots have to do their best to stay out of the way, David. We are led by very, very stupid people. Very, very stupid people. We cannot let it continue. We are a country that owes $19 trillion. We lose everywhere. We lose militarily. We can't beat ISIS. Give me a break. We can't beat anybody. Washington has abandoned its strategy to train the rebels in Syria. The Pentagon's announced it's pulling the plug on the $500 million campaign to build an opposition force on the ground after just one year, well short of expectations. We're also supporting a moderate opposition in Syria that can help us in this effort, who stand up to the bankrupt ideology of violent extremism. Can you tell us what the total number of trained fighters remains? Uh, it's a small number, and uh, uh, the ones that are in the fight is, uh, is, is we're talking four, four or five. Let's not kid ourselves, that's a joke. We have to acknowledge this is a total failure. It's just a failure. This train and equip program has not, uh, frankly, uh, uh, lived up to uh, what we initially thought. The program hasn't lived up to expectations. That's an understatement, isn't it? Well, instead of training the rebels, the U.S. says it will now supply ammunition and weapons to opposition groups engaged in combat. RT's Gianni Chikian went to the State Department briefing to find out more about Washington's Plan B. The State Department says that the U.S. quits training the Syrian rebels. Instead, it will focus on just equipping them. The move came after everyone learned that despite the program's budget of $500 million, the U.S. had only a handful of trained fighters in the battlefield against ISIL. Here's how the State Department spokesperson explained the policy shift. Everybody acknowledges that there were issues and challenges with respect to the training aspect uh, of some of these moderate opposition uh, fighters. But what has proven effective in the past, particularly in Syria, has been the equipping part of training and equipping. The State Department now says it will provide equipment to those in whom the U.S. has, quote-unquote, a measure of confidence. But it cannot say how the U.S. will measure that confidence. Because you've used this phrase now at least three times, and other officials have too, about this measure of confidence. What unit of measurement are we talking about here? Don't you need to be totally satisfied that these people are not, you know, rampant human rights abusers and beheaders? Is that a foot, a court, you know, what is it? It is, it is not, uh, I don't think it is, uh, I don't think we can enumerate it. The spokesperson also added that the measure of confidence will be based on knowledge and previous experience. Now, about that previous experience, the reason the U.S. scrapped the train and equip program the way it was initially designed is because it hasn't worked. The key question is why it hasn't worked. U.S. officials now seem very reluctant to talk about this, but a few months ago, Defense Secretary Ash Carter testified in Congress and said it's difficult to identify rebels with the right mentality who would not then turn over their weapons and themselves to ISIL. I reminded the State Department spokesperson of what the defense secretary said and again asked if he can explain why the program hasn't worked. Here's what I got. I would certainly not challenge the assessment of the defense secretary, but if you already had that, then you probably already had at least some of the answer to your question. Anyone who completes training at the camp is sent to a second camp to get more strict training before being sent to fight in Kobani. They tell us that we are going to fight Yazidis and kill them because they are infidels. And if you die, you will go to heaven and they will go to hell. We were more than 80 Yazidi children at the camp in addition to Muslim children. There were 5-year-old and 6-year-old children up to 15-year-olds. My 15-year-old cousin is still there. 
Military training included how to use the machine gun and undisciplined children were punished by leaving them under the sun or lashing them with the hose. Notorious for its brutality, mass killings, abduction and beheadings, ISIL has been telling jihadist groups worldwide that they must accept its supreme authority. Many already have, including some in Africa. In February this year, one of the group's most brutal and high-profile atrocities took place in Libya. ISIL-affiliated militants beheaded 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians. Two months later in April, some 30 Ethiopian Christian migrant workers would face a similar fate. The instability in Libya has provided a gateway for ISIL to make inroads there. Last year, jihadists declared a caliphate around the eastern town of Darna. In Egypt, its group there is known as Sinai province, responsible for a number of attacks in northern Sinai and even the capital Cairo. The group, which has been active on the Sinai Peninsula since the uprising in 2011, pledged its allegiance to ISIL last November. It is said to have at least a thousand militants. In January this year, Morocco announced its dismantled a cell sending fighters to join ISIL in Iraq and Syria. Tunisia too, which has also seen a number of terrorist attacks, is said to have the highest number of foreign fighters in ISIL. In Algeria, Frenchman Hav Guadel was among the first known victims of ISIL in Africa. He was kidnapped and beheaded last September by a group that declared itself an affiliate of the Islamic State. While ISIL's influence had long been visible in Boko Haram's six-year insurgency, it was only in March this year that the militants in Nigeria announced their allegiance to ISIL. ISIL, in turn, has been influenced by Boko Haram. When it took Yazidi hostages in Iraq in 2014, it cited Boko Haram's infamous kidnapping of 276 girls in Chibok. Currently, one of the biggest worries is the number of young people being lured to join ISIL ranks. South Africa and Ghana, among the most recent targets of recruitment, by ISIL forces. The story of a mother from Florida who slammed her son's high school world history book for dedicating too many pages to Muslim culture and history. In every chapter, they bring up something about Muslim or Islam, under Islam nation. There's a primary source page and it's all about the Quran. Even has verses from the Quran. You see that? Our children don't need to be taught this. Well, Christian Kyla Normandin has called for the book to be banned and vows to stop her children from learning about Islam. Some commentators say Americans have fallen victim to false stereotypes. This woman seemed to take offense over the fact that she thought the teaching of Arabic numbers was somehow bolstering or suggesting that Islam was beneficial because I think she misunderstood, among everything, what Arabic numbers were. A lot of people have no idea of what Arabs are or Sharia, Sharia. They don't know anything. They confuse anything using the word Arab or Arabic or Islam or Muslim with terrorism and Islamofascism or whatever term du jour you want to use. Many people are aware of the different Islamic groups in the world, from those marching across Africa and Iraq, to those in Iran and Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Turkey, and to the growing number of groups in Europe. Others are concerned about the Muslim Brotherhood, which is working in over 100 countries and has ties to radical Islam. It is even here in America. What are the declared goals of the Muslim Brotherhood to conquer America from within? 
How are they infiltrating our American schools, our textbooks, our financial institutions, our churches, our government, our law enforcement organizations, and our military? What is Sharia? And today we're going to talk about the Muslim Brotherhood's influence. They're infiltrating into American society. Start with the, uh, the ultimate objective of Islam. It is to create a global caliphate a super state, which will uh, usher in the reign of the Messiah or the Mahdi in the case of the Iranians. It's not clear exactly when they came into America, but we can say safely they were here in the early 60s. The Muslim Brotherhood denied that they were actually operating in America until Mohammed Morsi, who took over as the president of Egypt after the fall of Hosni Mubarak, stood up and proudly said, my wife and I joined the Muslim Brotherhood when we were going to college in California and we joined through the Muslim Student Association because you see the Muslim Student Association was the first entity that was created by the Muslim Brotherhood in America. Now there are many front groups for them now. You can go to the Holy Land Foundation trial unindicted co-conspirator list and you can find all the Muslim Brotherhood fronts, uh, at least those that were identified during that trial. But uh, Morsi blew the whistle and, and really let the cat out of the bag that, yeah, you can't deny anymore that the Muslim Brotherhood is operating in America. And they have all these front groups. And these front groups, John, are, have infiltrated every sector of our society. And it's a very dangerous situation. What was the motto of the Muslim Brotherhood when you were in it? You know, the, Allah is our way, you know, the Quran is our constitution, Muhammad is our leader, and dying for the sake of Allah is our highest aspiration. This is what we chanted daily while we were in camps. And our camp started in the mosques, you know, in, in the neighborhood mosques. That's where we chanted all this. But there's, uh, it is, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood today, you know, that is, uh, how do we know the radical from non-radical? It's very important formula. We asked these Muslims, you know, uh, do you believe that Sharia law should be part of the American Constitution or any European civilization? If they said yes, know that you are standing beside a radical or infiltrator because otherwise they run away from a radical Islam and they don't want Sharia law, you know, to be part of this. But uh, we did not come to be equal in here. We came to be, you know, uh, to, to change of culture. Well, we decided to launch a special Hannity investigation to find out if American Muslims think that Sharia law should supersede the U.S. Constitution. Earlier today, we sent out Fox News contributor David Webb to an Islamic cultural center in New York City. Now watch this closely. Your thoughts, should Sharia law supersede the U.S. Constitution? No, but uh, I, I think the Sharia law is made by, uh, by God, by Allah and the Constitution is made by people, so it's not the same. Do you believe that Sharia law should be above the U.S. Constitution? Yes. Yes. Sharia law is completely different than the United States Constitution. As a Muslim, you practice uh, my uh, Islamic law as a Muslim, but I, I uh, United States uh, Constitution, as a citizen, I have to respect the Constitution. Nothing to do with Sharia law. As a Muslim country, Sharia law is allowed other country no you have to have a right constitution should any religious law supersede the u.s constitution at any time any denomination um maybe in the future the u.s constitution deserve all the all the people living in u.s their rights right so sharia law does not contradict with the sharia law just protect our dignified we are like human being be respectful to be respectful in the society. So you think that the U.S. Constitution helpful. should should be the law of the land in the U.S.? Also helpful to protect our Sharia. Should Sharia law be over the U.S. Constitution? Yes. Every country has a different policy and different law, but I respect the law in any country I go. Do you believe that the tenets of Sharia law should be over the U.S. Constitution? No. No. That U.S. Constitution, which is made by people, mm. and the Sharia law is made by Allah, so that is all the way above. That has to be definitely in the land, not for the America, for the whole world, would be above. The so Sharia that law. should be above the U.S. Definitely. Constitution. Yes. So now we have Sharia-compliant financial transactions or insurance transactions 
And what people don't realize is when you do a financial transaction that is Sharia compliant, you're actually funding terrorism because the interest, even though they deny that there is interest, the interest on that is broken down into eight categories of zakat. Category number seven is those fighting in the cause of Allah for whom there is no other remuneration. Those are the terrorists. That's Al-Qaeda, that's ISIS, that's the Muslim Brotherhood, that category number seven. Tell the folks that we've actually bailed out the largest uh, Sharia-compliant uh, financial institution in our country. Yeah, AIG. When we had the bailouts going back to 2008, 2009, we bailed out AIG. They are the largest purveyor of Sharia-compliant insurance, which means everybody that transacts with them is supporting terrorism, not just globally, but right here at home. Yeah, uh, and it's just not AIG. No. I was shocked. People can just go and Google this, and they can find, if you put the Sharia-compliant co co companies, financial institutions, you will see a list of, of almost 100 different companies. Our biggest companies in America, financial institutions, uh, it really is shocking. And where is this money going to? Into jihad, you know, because in, in, in Sharia law, a certain amount of uh, money must go to jihad. But in other instances, according to the hadith, that the whole money can go into jihad. So, and therefore, and what kind of jihad? That is called uh, the stilt jihad, which is civilization jihad. Your motto said, jihad is our way, and death for the sake of Allah is our wish. In Islam, isn't it true that jihad has different definitions? And there are different ways to do jihad, depending on which society that you are in. Talk about the different ways to do jihad. We have to understand what the Quran said. The Quran said if you could not fight physically, you, have, you must fight with other means, financially, uh, you know, logistically, uh, civically, you know, however you can fight. You know, in the United States of America today, we fight, you know, we find the, the way they're fighting, there are a lot of lobbyists. There are thousands of those lobbyists that are lobbying our, you know, our, our government. And so therefore, that is a strategy to shift our our nation, but when you look at jihad itself, in the Shia world, they declare the sixth pillar as as you know the as jihad. You know the Sunnis; it's an invisible pillar, which is it is every Muslim committed you know to do jihad. And the way of jihad, you know, there are multitude of those. You know, one of them, for example, is jihad of the womb, moving into a state and therefore start birthing, having children, taking over. Uh, a civilization. The other one, it is by subjugating the culture and all its freedom to your needs, where they start, you know, they become slave to you. The other one, it's political jihad. Then they have banking jihad, the financial jihad. Then you have uh, jihad, you know, the jurisprudence, the 9-11. And then you have what, uh, what we spoke about before, uh, about the three strategy doctrines, al-Kitman, al taqiya and, uh, you know, these are, you know, how to change and lie for the sake of Islam to establish Islamic civilization. In the Quran, the Quran says, وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ مَكَرِينَ Meaning, Allah has deceived and the, and the Christian and Jews deceive, but Allah is the greatest deceiver. So that the strategy for Islam, number one, on this is to deceive their enemy. So, organizations like Muslim Brotherhood and all of their affiliates get into the universities. Uh, they create Islamic chairs. They fund it with $20 million like the Wahhabi, the Saudi monies do. Then they put in their version of Islam there. They create Muslim student associations where they train up these Muslim student associations to put fear into those and they call it Islamophobia. So now you've targeted them. They call out those who do characters of Muhammad as not only Islamic phobic, but in Europe they'll, they'll call it a crime that should be punished like the Norwegian cartoonist and so forth. That is, they'll do everything they can in order to neutralize that great Satan of America, to take over by population and by laws in places of Europe like the Sharia courts in Great Britain, or making it a crime to do hate speech like we find in Canada or other places. And at the same time, they're advancing their cause across North Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and other places. So all of the trend is moving towards them. And all of the defeat seems to be moving towards us at the same time. And they're winning because jihad is not merely physical at this point. 
it is cultural, it is political, and the trend is sweeping across the world in their favor. Yeah, Jerry, you've also uh, talked about uh, Muslim Appreciation Day up there in Dearborn, Michigan. Oh yeah, I go up to Dearborn uh, twice a year, and it's absolutely incredible that they could have a, uh, an Arab festival and Christians could be standing four blocks away uh, handing out Bible tracts, four blocks away, and they get arrested and prosecuted for what? Free speech certainly, you know, applies in this situation. Kamal is speaking up in that area there, and the sheriff or the police chief comes and closes down his event. No free speech in that area. Why? Dearborn, Michigan is the largest uh, Islamic culture, Islamic enclave in America. And they have basically uh, decided that there will be no, no uh, free speech in that area, and the law enforcement has fallen in with them. And this is all part of uh, affecting our, our education of the next generation. And when you have history books, for example, that get into our school systems that say Muslims discovered America, that write one passage about uh, Jesus Christ, and 72 uh, references to Muhammad, uh, we have a problem. We're telling them this information about the Muslim Brotherhood and its infiltration into our country. For what reason? Why do we want them to know this? Why do we want them to know they're penetrating our educational system, they're penetrating television, they're penetrating our financial institutions, and we've got four or five more big spheres of influence we're going to talk about next week, including our churches and the mosques and other places. Why do we want people to know this? Well, first of all, truth is eternally vigilant, and you only have the lighthouse of America that really stands for freedom and they're recognizing the more they can infiltrate the less freedom we can purvey around the world. Not only are we going to give up our own freedoms but they're seeing that in Europe and they're setting up their own Sharia court systems in places like Great Britain to such an extent that they're just winning over very quietly. They don't want to awaken the sleeping giants for the reason uh, the militaries can't beat our militaries but they certainly can do it generationally. And jihad is always generational. And there's one other key to it, which goes back to General Boykin talking about at the beginning of the show. Remember when Hitler wants to say, how do you get the Jews out? And an ultimate key to jihad is Jerusalem and all of Israel. There really isn't a complete victory until they win over. That's why Yasser Arafat never had Israel on the map. They want to take out, and the only supporters of Israel right now that are helping in the defense of Israel besides itself is the United States of America. Everyone else seems to have abandoned them. So they have certain goals of infiltrating, but the ultimate goal of conquering Jerusalem, Israel, and of course as far as they can because they want Dar Islam. They want the House of Islam to conquer the entire world. Today and in this Intifada, we applaud all our people and bless their Intifada and resistance and stand respectfully to individual examples that are making history. We call for the deepening of the spirit of the Intifada and the resistance and to provide all means of support to our Palestinian people, especially for our people in Jerusalem and the West Bank. Gaza is ready for this battle and for this blessed Intifada. The negotiations ended. There is an American and a Zionist decision to stop negotiations. There must also be a Palestinian decision to stop these negotiations as well. Raging in different parts of Palestine. Seven, several people have been killed in clashes on the Gaza border, with heavy scuffles have also been seen on the West Bank. Clashes have intensified in the region since the start of the month. Israeli authorities say a 16-year-old Palestinian stabbed two Jews. The mayor of Jerusalem now telling, Isra uh, telling Israelis it is their duty to carry licensed firearms to fight off Palestinian stabbers. 
In Gaza, medical sources say at least seven Palestinians were killed and 90 injured as a result of violence there this week. Our Ben Wiedemann is in Jerusalem. Ben, this violence seems to be stemming from the recent restrictions by the Israeli government on a holy site, but there obviously is more to it than just that. What's sparking the violence? Well, at the moment, it is related to the situation on the Temple Mount or the Haram al-Sharif, as it's known uh, to Muslims. Uh, increasingly, uh, there seems to be a desire among some Israelis uh, to be able to go onto the uh, the Temple Mount and worship, and that is something that uh, wasn't supposed to happen under the so-called status quo that existed on the Temple Mount uh, for decades. But really, uh, when you're looking at the the forest of this conflict, that's just the latest uh, tree. It really goes back to the fact that uh, this conflict remains unresolved now uh, for decades, going back at least to 1967. You'll recall that uh, last spring, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry uh, failed and once again, the United States failing to work out some sort of permanent peace agreement uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And what you get in the absence of even the impression or the idea that there may be a peace process uh, at work and peace somewhere down the road, you have increasingly the feeling among many people that peace is never uh, coming. And you have, for instance, according to the Palestinian Census Bureau, 70 percent of the population of the West Bank and Gaza is under the age of 29. Increasingly, many of them have, obviously all of them, have lived under Israeli occupation their entire lives. They see that there's no political process leading to some sort of peace in the creation of two states. And so increasingly people are turning to violence in the hopes of achieving some sort of end result. The Jerusalem spot where five Israelis were attacked by knife-wielding Palestinians in two separate incidents hours apart. The Palestinian perpetrators in both cases were shot dead by Israeli forces on the scene. Israel's government is beefing up security in the city sacred to Christianity, Islam and Judaism by calling up reserve forces. But the so-called lone wolf attacks continue. Many of the attacks have happened here in Jerusalem. But as the situation continues escalating, we are also seeing it fan out. Palestinians frustrated by decades of occupation and fearing an Israeli government attempt to wrest control of holy Islamic sites are taking to the streets of Ramallah, Hebron, Nablus, Gaza, and Israel's Arab-populated cities. Over a 24-hour period, 10 Palestinians were shot dead by Israeli forces. Dozens of others were wounded. We don't respond immediately with a seemingly magical solution, but by operating in a measured, methodical manner. In that manner, we will prove the terrorism does not pay, and we will overcome it. But as the violence continues, the only thing overcoming Israelis and Palestinians appears to be a growing atmosphere of fear, mistrust. Chanting, God is great, crowds march through the West Bank village of Yatta for the funeral of a 17-year-old Palestinian. He was shot dead by Israeli special forces after he stabbed a soldier on a bus. In nearby Hebron, another funeral, this time for a Palestinian man who was killed after he stabbed an Israeli police officer in the arm and tried to take his weapon away. Clashes also broke out in the West Bank city of Ramallah, where hundreds of Palestinians faced off with Israeli forces. A steady rise in street violence over the last 11 days has been fueled by confrontations around Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque complex, a site revered by both Muslims and Jews. Palestinians fear increasing visits by Jewish groups to Al-Aqsa are eroding long-time Muslim religious control there. Both Israeli and Palestinian leaders have sought to calm tensions. But as Israeli forces shot dead three Palestinian assailants and two Palestinian teenagers on Saturday, there seem to be few signs of the violence dying down. Now, the UN rights chief has voiced concern about reports that over 130 Palestinians have been injured by Israeli live ammunition in recent days. Zayed Rad al Hussein said the high number of casualties, in particular those resulting from the use of live ammunition, raises concerns of Israel's excessive use of force. 
The UN rights chief also warned that more bloodshed will only lead to more hatred. Palestine's UN ambassador says Palestinians are facing massive military force with their bare chests. Riyad Mansour warned that Israel is chasing children and shooting them from the back, which is the conduct of an occupying army. Meanwhile, the Palestinian president has called on Israel to keep away from Muslims' holy sites. We don't attack anyone and we want Israelis to stop attacking us. We want them not to enter Al-Aqsa. We support those who are protecting the Al-Aqsa Mosque, those who suffer a great deal to protect Al-Aqsa. We tell Israel, stay away from our holy places, the Islamic and Christian holy places. We want peace and our hands will remain extended for peace regardless of what is happening to us. We hear again and again lies about Israelis intention toward the holy mountain, only to Jews and Muslims. Let me be very clear. Israel has no intention whatsoever to change the status quo. But this status quo, this important understanding, needs two sides to keep it. We will continue to respect Muslims' prayers and at the side of the mosques and the shrine. But Muslims must respect the Jewish connection to Jerusalem, the Jews who live in Jerusalem, and the Jews who visit it, its holy sites. We came here to say enough. What has been in the past shall never be again. We will not let it continue. We stand here and demand from the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister himself, you are responsible. We elected you and we demand from you security, a change of perception. The enemies of Israel should be trampled, chased after. We demand you, Mr. Prime Minister, to instruct now at the Cabinet meeting, which is taking place right now, to instruct me as head of Samaria Regional Council to build tomorrow morning a new settlement between Itamar and Elon More, where Jews have been murdered. Today, the governor of South Carolina warned people on the coast that floods are heading their way. Columbia has already gotten the worst of it. Have a look at Kaufman Road before and after when a large chunk of it was washed away. David Begno has one woman's story. David? Scott, it was Sunday morning as an elderly woman was headed to church and she got stuck right here. Before the road failed, as the water was moving across, her vehicle stuck in the middle was pushed off the side and down about 20 yards into a ditch where she picked up her phone and dialed 911. On Sunday morning in Columbia, rescue teams were overwhelmed with calls for help. They have a person that's in the vehicle just about to be submerged. We have one pickup truck with a 73-year-old man inside. He's about to be washed over. 71-year-old Clara Gant was one of those who needed help, and she needed it desperately. She was on her way to church when she got caught in flood water. When did you realize you were in trouble? I realized it when my car stalled on the bridge. She called her family as rushing water pushed her car into the front yard of a church. I am afraid I want to get out of this. All of a sudden, she saw her grandson, Travis Ketchings. He had secured himself to a rope and floated her way. I'm so glad to see him, but I was afraid for him, too. I said, hey, Mima, and I smiled at her, and she smiled back. She said, hey, Trav. I said, we're going to get you out of here. He pulled Gant out of the car, and to keep her from being swept away, grabbed onto a large red cross that was in the churchyard. Together, grandmother and grandson held on for four hours. While waiting, 
catching is recorded at the moment on a cell phone. It was like being in the midst of a, a raging river. Yeah, I cling to the cross every day. Sunday, I was literally clinging to a cross. This grandmother is thankful for her faith and her grandson. He saved your life. I call him my hero, but he doesn't want me to call him that. But... I love you, and that's, that's what we're here for. I love you, too. I'm glad you're here. If you're wondering what happened to that cross, it disappeared. It was last seen floating away.